Welcome everybody on behalf of the Holocaust Museum LA. My name is Michael Morgenstern and I'm an educator at the museum. And this afternoon you have the honor and privilege of listening to Misha Dichter share his story with you. And you'll be able to ask questions as well at the end. Before we begin, I would like to share a quick history of our museum. Holocaust Museum LA was founded in the early 1960s by a group of Holocaust survivors who wanted to make sure that future generations would always remember and learn from this tragic history. In the early 1960s, most survivors were not yet willing to relive their trauma, largely because most people were not yet ready to listen to them. But thanks to the courage and foresight of this group of survivors, we have what became the first and oldest Holocaust Museum in the United States, always with a mission to commemorate, educate, and inspire future generations. It is our honor and privilege to um, to have this program today, this afternoon, um, and we, um, excuse me, oh, and after um, after our program, we'll have a Q and A session. The survivor talk is in conjunction with Holocaust Museum LA's never before seen exhibit, Hidden History recounting the Shanghai Jewish story. Hidden history tells stories of survival, courage, and hope of Jewish refugees in Shanghai before, during, and after World War II. This timely examination of the plight of refugees forced to abandon their home country as a result of persecution and violence speaks to the extraordinary spirit of resilience and resistance. Hidden History explores this multifaceted history of desperation, loss, and asylum through survivor stories and the photographic lens of prominent American photojournalist Arthur Rothstein. Misha, thank you so much for being with us this afternoon and for sharing your family's story. It's my honor to be with you. Hello. And what I'm thinking we can start by sharing a little bit of your parents' um, testimony. And if you would like to preface this by um, talking about it and explaining how you have this video, and then I can share a little bit to show our audience. Right, I understand we have a bit of audio problem with that. So uh, I guess what you'll get is just a few seconds of uh, my parents speaking in their home in Los Angeles in 1990. And um, this was an amazing event that cousins of ours from Detroit arrived at their house one fall uh, afternoon in 1990 and set up a tripod and simply said to my parents, tell your story of how you got out of Poland, how you got to Shanghai. And, you know, I had spent my, you know, as you had said in the introduction, uh, in the early 60s, it was too soon and, and they didn't want to talk about it. I didn't ask enough questions and I didn't really know enough about uh, their, their impossible, uh, possibly hor horrible past. And uh, so the cousins set up this, this uh, tripod and said, tell your story. And there they are sitting in their, their living room and uh, starting out with their beginnings in Warsaw, bombs starting to fall. I see just the image of Holocaust Museum LA. I'm assuming, assuming everything's fine here. I should. Yes, we, we can see you and hear you. Thank yeah, you. Okay. So uh, beginning with, and, and there's this one hour video that I'm so grateful uh, was made because soon after that, my mother had had a stroke and a uh, couple of years later, lost her ability to speak. My father uh, had the beginnings of Alzheimer's not long after that. So this was an amazing opportunity that they seized to simply tell the story as, as they uh, recounted it. And uh, this, the tidbits that I think are really important in, in this, uh, actually going backwards. I was born in Shanghai in 1945. I was 
Uh, my family was among, I think, the between 20 and 30,000 Jews who survived uh, the war in Shanghai, uh, not knowing, I think, for the most part, uh, most of the tragedies befalling uh, the rest of the Jews in Europe at the time, and as impossible as their existence had been in Shanghai during the war, uh, they, they only learned really right at the end of it uh, that they were relatively the lucky ones. So in this video, my parents start out with uh, things starting to seem impossible, the writing obviously on the wall, and knowing that they had no future there, so they sought out the man who's now become rather well known, uh, Sugihara, uh, who, to, who was giving out as quickly as he could against the will of the, uh, the Japanese government transit visas in the, my parents' case, and I think in the case of many hundreds, if not thousands of Jews at the time, transit visas to Dutch Curaçao, which was not requiring any visas at the time. So they were part of the eastward moving group at the outset of the war that uh, took Trans-Siberian Railroad, wound up in Kobe, Japan for six months. Then as my parents described it, with the advent of Pearl Harbor, they were evicted and thrown into uh, Shanghai and eventually into the Shanghai ghetto. So in a nutshell, that is what transpired. And I will share a little bit of this video with the audience now so that you can um, see a little bit of, of this. Unfortunately, the sound isn't working, but it's important to see Misha's parents sitting in their home um, talking about this experience. Right. I'm reminded the, uh, the little Chinese figurines above the bookshelf there were about the only thing that they managed to come to this country with at the time. It's a pity we don't have uh, clear audio, but at that moment, my father's describing at the outset of the war, they were living in Danzig, Gdynia, and... Uh, paying their way basically to get out of Poland. And you know, seeing the horrors that are going on today with Ukraine, uh, my father couldn't have known in 1990, you know, what we would be facing exactly right now. But somewhere in this video, he says, and you know, as I look back through all of the impossible horrors of that period, I realize today that people have learned nothing, that people will not be kind to each other necessarily. And uh, he, you know, he was not an optimist about the human race with all he had seen, and he, he thought that we have learned nothing since then. Thank you for sharing. Moving back a little bit, can you please share with us who your parents were and where they were from and a little bit about their families? Sure. Uh, so they were both in Poland. My father from a town in Vladimiritz, and my mother from Pinsk, and uh, my wife Sipa and I were amazed to see, you know, we're both pianists, uh, met at the Juilliard School in 1965. And we were amazed to see on one of our visits to Israel for my concerts there, we went to the Diaspora Museum, and lo and behold, on a map of where families came from, there was my wife's uh, father's town, Bialystok, probably about 30 miles from uh, my father's town, Vladimiritz. And, you know, we couldn't help thinking. Um, so I had to be born in Shanghai and find my way to New York, uh, to the Juilliard School. She was born in Brazil with uh, her family's earlier migration from Russia and Poland, uh, earlier in the 20th century, winding up in Rio de Janeiro, she goes to the Juilliard School. We have to meet in chorus with this arc of Shanghai, uh, Brazil, New York, where we could have met one small train ride away from each other had there not been the unbelievable upheaval, upheaval of the 20th century. Thank you for sharing. Um, did your parents talk much about their families, their parents and siblings? 
only in later years it became clear to me that it was tearing my father apart year after year to know that there was no way of his surviving if he had tried to escape with anyone a uh, greater number of people than uh, my mother, uh, that they had to leave behind their respective very large families who would perish in the Holocaust. And I think it, it uh, haunted him through the, the rest of his life. So uh, he had that, that burden to bear, but he wouldn't have been, I think he wouldn't have been able to, uh, to live to tell about it had, uh, had it not worked out that way. Thank you for sharing. So were your parents married before the war? Yes, they were married in, uh, in the early 30s. And uh, they had this story. I mean, the, the one little image that I will first seen that I will never forget in this, this little video of uh, they're telling their story. They are hiding in a farmhouse in Ukraine. I guess they were finding their way eventually to Moscow, then to take the Trans-Siberian to Vladivostok and then uh, Japan. So they're hiding, a family had taken them in and uh, hiding in this farmhouse and along come some soldiers. And I'm pretty certain they described them as Ukrainian soldiers. So the sense of history now as we're experiencing it is, is overwhelming. Uh, of course, they were, not, uh, they were not wonderful people in those days. They were, they were on the wrong side, shall we say. They burst into the farmhouse suspecting that people were hiding. My father was hiding under the bed. My mother was sitting there nervously trying not to let on that anything was amiss. And uh, as they describe it in, in this video, they looked at my mother's profile, saw her little upturned nose and said basically, not Jewish, we don't have to kill her. And that by you know the grace of God goes her life. Thank you for sharing that powerful story. Um, and it also uh, speaks to what you said earlier, how fortunate you are to have this recording um, because this journey was certainly dangerous. Um, and uh, the fact that they both were able to talk about it um, later in life in these details and that you have it and your family has it. Um, is really important. So thank you for sharing that. Historically, it's enormously important. And uh, later in that video, finally to try to describe their years in Shanghai, you know, my father was trying to make ends meet anywhere he could, uh, buying for X amount and selling for X plus a little bit more and living out the war that way. And uh, the, these cousins asked my mother, and what were you doing at the time? She said, basically, I was ill the entire time with typhus and all these horrible diseases that were sweeping the, uh, the ghetto in Shanghai. So uh, they, they, at any moment, their lives were, were impossibly threatened. And you know, it's an interesting story. And I think just as individual humans, we can learn from, you know, from this, from resisting the machinery, shall we say, of, of, uh, of the military. Um, there, there was a film crew that visited our apartment here, Japanese film crew seven, several years ago, because they were very proud of the accomplishments of uh, the consul that I mentioned earlier, the Japanese consul Sugihara, who had taken it upon himself. His, his wife had urged him to even up his, uh, his work in stamping as many visas as he possibly could. And uh, this Japanese film crew came to the apartment here in New York and said, so please tell us about Sugihara. And I said, you know, my parents uh, were able to survive because of these, these transit visas from the Japanese consul. And they said, so you are grateful to the Japanese government uh, for their having saved your family. And I made very clear because there's something to learn from this. And I wasn't being anti any particular nationality. I simply said, uh, I don't think you get the point of this. This was one person rising against the will of his government to save lives when his conscience demanded it. And that one person uh, is honored in Israel for that very fact. Well, uh, I don't have to explain that uh, that video was never shown.
Thank you for sharing. So when your parents left Poland, um, I know you briefly explained their um, their their journey and how they where they stopped. At what point did they arrive in Shanghai, and what do you know about their arrival there? Well, they had gone to Japan with the hopes of uh, the quotas being lifted because their goal was always to to arrive in the United States. It was a pretense to go to Dutch Curacao. He, under the pretense of going there to be a rabbi, actually. So they were waiting out for six months at least uh, any possibility to be in transit from Kobe, Japan to San Francisco, shall we say, Los Angeles. And then Pearl Harbor broke out. And as I said, they were thrust into Shanghai. That's where they lived out the war. Uh, and he told a story that actually that as the years went on and the war ended and the Americans uh, sorted things out in Shanghai, that he was pretty much making a living there. And for two years until the communists took over in China, he thought he could actually make a go of establishing a life for his new family there. And then that changed everything. And he got on uh, with my mother and me at the age of two uh, on the SS General Gordon to San Francisco. And there's an interesting aside to this. I noticed you have as a guest coming up, uh, Lawrence Tribe, uh, esteemed legal scholar. And I connected with him several years ago because he had written an article, I think about uh, President Obama and the, the little byline said, Lawrence Tribe was born in Shanghai and whatever. And I connected with him and in this wonderful age of ours in which you can meet somebody within 30 seconds through the internet, he wrote back and said, uh, I was on the SS General Gordon in the spring of 47 to San Francisco. When did you go? And I said, Thanksgiving 47. And since then he came to concerts of mine and we reconnect, we connected for the first time and uh, established a friendship. But that was yet another story of a, of a Shanghai Jew. Thank you so much for sharing. So you were born in Shanghai in 1945, um, and you left when you were two years old. What do you know about your life in Shanghai? Precious little. I have vague memories of a, a nanny uh, pushing a pram around in various uh, Shanghai parks. Mind you, the, the war had started, had, had stopped in, I was born in September 45, so I think the war was weeks over. And uh, I have very, very little memory. I do remember a very bumpy boat ride coming to San Francisco. Thank you for sharing. Um, and then how long did you live in San Francisco? Not at all. Uh, they, they settled immediately in Los Angeles. My father started a business there. And, uh, you know, it's kind of crazy, the, the timeline from his arriving with nothing in 1947 to his finding work uh, always, you know, he describes that he was in the, in the lumber business in Poland. I don't know how that was possible, but things had to be built in the 1930s with lumber, maybe on a small scale, people were building houses. But uh, he said that Los Angeles was the place because there was going to be a building boom. And that's where he settled. And 13 years after arriving uh, in California from China, he bought uh, our family a house in Beverly Hills, which I think is testament to his, his resolve to make a success of himself. And uh, I think he eventually became proud that I was a concert pianist because he would have all his business associates fill boxes at the Hollywood Bowl when I was playing there. Thank you for sharing. At what point did you learn anything about your parents' story and about um, about their lives during the war? I was not a good son. Let's put it that way. They took me to dinner parties. Uh, I guess they've never heard of babysitters, so I accompanied them to. There were many. Uh, 
gatherings of, of refugees from the old country who would recount their old stories in, in Polish or Russian, uh, sing uh, folk songs around the piano. That's probably where I first heard a piano and began to love it. And I didn't ask any questions. And we would be at dinner parties when I was eight or nine or 10. And my father would meet somebody new sitting next to him and I'd be on the other side. And he would say, hello, my name is Leon Dichter. Would you like to hear how I got out of Europe? And I would roll my eyes thinking, oh, dad, please, not again. And because of the eye rolling, I just didn't hear it out as I should have. And again, I'm very, very thankful for this, this video that now is, as an adult and with family grown, I have two grown sons and five grandchildren and everybody uh, I'm interested, shall we say, to the, at the very least in, in their roots. It's, it's amazing to have, uh, have these facts available to them. Do you remember at what point you started um, telling people where you were born and anything about your family story? I never shared it. I never, it never seemed pertinent. I was too busy trying to carve my own place as a musician. So all I knew was piano lessons, music theory lessons, going to school, having friends in LA, being a normal person, and eventually going off to Juilliard and, and having a career. And you know, it, what, again, because I wasn't that aware of, of the details of their, their uh, transits during the war years, I, I think now what it must have seemed to my parents where in 1939 or 40, there they are in transit across, uh, across Russia on the Trans-Siberian Railroad with their uh, point of embarkation being Moscow. And uh, 16, 26 years later in 1966, I went to Moscow to enter the Tchaikovsky competition and they accompanied me. And I never put, you know, obviously I had a couple of things on my mind such as maybe getting a prize. It never occurred to me to ask them, what are your feelings, mom and dad, about coming back to Moscow under these circumstances when uh, your lives were in danger 26 years ago? Thank you. What languages did your parents speak? There must have been a lot of Yiddish between them because that's why I can understand a good deal of it. Uh, there was Russian and Polish, which I never learned. And uh, English, they made it a point of learning English from day one. So there was very little of any other language in the household in the 40s and 50s. And you mentioned that you had a, a cousin who recorded their testimony in the 90s. Um, who was this cousin and how... Um, how did they, did, how did your cousin or your cousin's parents survive? You know, again, I didn't ask enough questions and I'm sure we have uh, living cousins now. This, these are on my, my father's side who can explain the, the genealogy uh, very, very clearly, but they were early uh, in the U.S. And uh, I don't know when that branch of the family actually came from Russia or Poland. Uh, but now that you've asked that, I will make that my personal uh, quest to find the answer to that. Thank you. If anybody has questions, please use the Q&A box and we'll answer as many questions as possible. We do have a question. Um, do you know what happened to Sugihara? Yes, uh, he was considered a dishonorable person by his government, left without pension, and I think pretty much left to die a pauper. Thank you for sharing. One of our viewers is interested in learning more about your music education in Los Angeles, and where did you study, and um, who did you study with? Well, that's one of my favorite stories. Uh, I'll go back to the 1950s when the, 
the joke going around LA was two women at farmer's market uh, at the vegetable stand. And one says, uh, so I'm going to the Hollywood Bowl tonight. And the other said, well, who's playing? And she says, well, it's, it's the Beethoven Triple Concerto with Heifetz, Rubenstein, and Piatigorsky. And the other woman says, oh, local talent. And that was the amazing thing of LA at the time uh, where my parents lived, where that uh, video took place up on Hillcrest Road in Beverly Hills. Groucho Marx was eight doors down when I made my second recording of Stravinsky's Petrushka for RCA in the 60s. Stravinsky lived down the hill from my parents. So I dropped the, the record at his front door and I heard years later that he had tossed off a, a letter basically saying, I received your recording of my Petrushka. I don't really like it, Igor Stravinsky. Uh, that was apparently filed away because it was a valuable letter. It was never sent to me. I think it's in some Stravinsky archive in Switzerland, but it would be like having a letter from Beethoven saying, I heard you play my sonata the other night at Carnegie Hall. You don't understand my music. It would be great to have a pan by Igor Stravinsky. But I say this because it, it, I took for granted that Heifetz and, and Stravinsky and Piatigorsky and, and all these giants lived in Los Angeles at the time. And that's really the reason uh, that I started piano because as I mentioned earlier, these, these soirees really, uh, these evenings that my parents attended with other emigres uh, standing around a piano singing the folk songs of, of uh, the old country. Uh, there was a man who we, became very close to later uh, in the later years, Bronislav Kaper, who among other things wrote High Lily, High Low, and Cozy Koza in Night at the Opera of the Marx Brothers. And he was a brilliant, brilliant musician. He was a Polish, refu Polish Jewish refugee, lived in Beverly Hills. And whenever we'd go to Los Angeles, uh, when I go there to play concerts, we'd drop our bags immediately and go right over to visit Bronick. And he recalled having told my parents when I was six or seven years old, he was at one of those parties. And he told the story that I would go over to the piano at the breaks between their singing and go over to the piano and start noodling around because it just captivated me. And he went to my parents and said, why don't you give that kid some piano lessons? And those are my humble beginnings in music. But I was lucky to have studied uh, musical theory with a pupil of Arnold Schoenberg out there, a great man named Leonard Stein. And my fantastic piano teacher out there was Abi Tserko, who was a pupil of Arthur Schnabel in, in Berlin. So uh, the lineage is, is great because LA had these giants who had escaped the way my parents had for, for similar reasons. Uh, they all seemed to be Jewish, isn't that coincidental, except for Stravinsky. So um, the, my music education was first rate in LA because of that. And when I went to Juilliard again, uh, another Russian Jewish woman, Rosina Levine, who was 84 when I went to her, uh, became my, my teacher. And uh, it was this continuum of traditional, great German uh, music making and music theory to the great Russian school of piano playing. It was uh, an amazing couple of worlds to to experience. Thank you for sharing. Um, you studied in, so you started in Los Angeles um, and your parents were also there. At what point did you leave Los Angeles? Well, I didn't want to leave my piano teacher or my uh, theory, music theory teacher. So I spent one year living at home, not much fun, uh, going to UCLA. And then this teacher whom I would follow to Juilliard, Rosina Levine, came and gave a master class in 1964. And I fell in love with her. I knew I had to, to pursue this woman and I, I had to study with her. And uh, she took me, she was 84. I thought, my goodness, I'm, I'm burning all my bridges here to go with an 84 year old woman. She lived to be 96, bless her heart. She was a great teacher. She had taught Van Cliburn and uh, leading up to his triumph in Moscow in 58. And uh, she had seen it all. And uh, it was wonderful to, 
to avail myself of, of that level of um, teaching and of the Russian tradition. She, she had her name with her husband uh, as gold medalist in the Moscow Conservatory in the 1880s. So, and uh, in one of the lessons with her, this, this still gives me chills when I think of it, when I was preparing for the Moscow competition and one of the required pieces of this is Tchaikovsky Piano Concerto. In one of the lessons, I was playing the Tchaikovsky for her and she stopped me and she said, you know, Misha, in this one place here, Tchaikovsky told my husband that you must do this and this and that. I thought, oh my goodness, I better listen to this. How's that for a link with history? Thank you for sharing there. Um, you had, so you, you mentioned, um, that you, you had a different career from your parents. Can you talk a little bit more about what your parents did in Los Angeles? Yes, my father was in the lumber business and building. So he, there's actually, believe it or not, I said proudly a Dixter street in San Diego because he supplied so many so much lumber for the building boom in that part of the, the state uh, for tract houses that, uh, you know, it was, they just couldn't stop building down there. And he was a supplier. And uh, so they had comfortable lives in Beverly Hills. I'm, I'm happy to say that they lived uh, very, very comfortably to their last days. you um how do you think they coped with their experiences throughout their lives um was this something that was evident to you that you could see no not really and i remember on my father's passing we met uh with a rabbi in los angeles the day before the service and my two grown sons had flown out and we met with this rabbi. He was not the one who had known my father. He was a young rabbi. And he said, tell me about your father. And I said, well, he was a difficult man, kind of tough, difficult for him to show affection. And then um, the rabbi asked my two sons, and tell us about your grandpa. Oh, warm, loving, affectionate, wonderful. And the rabbi looked at me. And, you know, this was better than 20 years of therapy. He looked and said, your father lost everything when he left his family behind. Do you think he, it would be easy for him to simply, simply open up his heart and just start loving again that, that easily? You know, you've got to grant him that. And I had never seen it that clearly because, you know, my father didn't wear it on his sleeve, his past. But in the context of that, uh, it made a lot of sense. Thank you for sharing this with us. And what about your mother? Do you know anything about the way she coped throughout her life? Uh, she made my life possible because he, as I said, was a rather, a rather strict person. And uh, she, she gave me breathing room and she was the buffer between us. And thank God for her. And um, she was a sweetheart. What can I say? She, she appreciated the life that she had finally come to in Los Angeles, she almost died uh, daily in their, in their plight in Shanghai. So nobody could have appreciated life more than she did when they finally had some peace. And then as a related question, how did you cope with this, with their history and with, um, with your childhood? As you mentioned, having a father who, um, who I think seems to have handled his past um, in a difficult way as raising a son. Um, as I said earlier, this was not something I was aware of. You know, a, a kid is very interested in pursuing his own goals. And uh, since they were reticent to talk about their experiences as I was growing up, and I certainly was red reticent to ask them questions, uh, I was not aware that any past experience like the horrors that I now am aware of, uh, any such past experience was affecting uh, their daily lives later on, later on in, their, in their later years.
And then you mentioned that his relationship with your children were was different. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and what you could see of him, uh, his role as a grandfather to your children? Well, he couldn't have been happier. And as a businessman, of course, he referred to the grandchildren as his dividends. Ha uh -huh. But uh, when we came there to visit, uh, you know, he built them a, a little playhouse in the back and he couldn't have been prouder of, of the whole setting. So I think it was a wonderful thing uh, for, him, for him to have in his later years. Remind us when your parents passed away. My father in 97, my mother in 2003. Do you stay in touch with others who have origins in Shanghai? Not really, no, not really. When you settled, your family settled in Los Angeles in 1947. Um, do you remember your parents associating with other survivors a lot or were their friends a pretty um, diverse group? Well, it's those parties that I described of their standing around a piano singing the old songs, uh, they were all people who had one way or the other come maybe through Shanghai or some other possibility. Um, of, of escape, um, they were they were all refugees that had had experienced a similar plight, and they were very old and eventually died out, of course. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of uh, more questions focused on your musical career and expertise. What do you think the stylistic differences are that you gained by studying with um, Jewish pianists and theorists? Do you think it's different? I can't say that it's different, but they were very smart. And I love smart people. And um, the, I was given early on the tools to keep on exploring. I like to think that if um, my teacher in LA, Avi Tserko, who was, as I said, a schnabel pupil. Uh, if I could explain to him today what he taught me led to in other tiers of understanding a composition, I think he'd be, be very proud to hear that. Mrs. Levine, coincidentally, another Jewish pianist, uh, and her husband, Joseph Levine, who was one of the greatest pianists of all time, just go to YouTube and type in Joseph Levine plays anything that's as good as piano playing ever got. Um, she was a, a, a natural. She, she was unencumbered by too much thought. If, if you asked her a question, she would say, oh dear, the composers didn't think that way. Just, just you're asking too many questions. So I was grateful for having had the, um, the rigors of uh, real structural understanding of composition before I went to a great Russian pianist who, who set me free. I don't know that the second would have worked, the setting free would have worked without the rigors of the understanding of the structure. I'm, I was very happy to have both. That they happen to be very smart Jewish teachers is a bonus. Thank you for sharing. Um, were you familiar with Hans Eisler or Kurt Weil? Uh, names, of course, very well known, no, no. We have somebody um, who was all, who's listening, who was born in Shanghai, um, wants to know if you remember their parents, Minnie and Hans Schwartz. Um, that they says that they knew your parents. Wow, really? Well, there you go. No, I was two years old. I'm sorry, I would have loved it. My goodness, really. I, I have friends who visit uh, the synagogue in Shanghai saying my parents' name names are there. And that's as, as much of, a, of an overlap as I've, I've heard, but my goodness, 
That's amazing to hear. Thank you. Um, thank you for sharing. And I can put you in touch with this um, with this viewer. It's interesting that we can make these connections this way. It's that amazing. It's, it's a wonderful world in that respect. Yes, somebody can listen to our talk and make the connection that their parents knew your parents in Shanghai. Wow. Wow. Um, and have you visited Shanghai um, as an adult? No, I was going to go uh, last year actually to play concerts of a friend, again, old friend from LA, Lawrence Foster, conductor, uh, whom I played with, with the first with the Young Musicians Foundation Orchestra, which the, that foundation still exists in LA, a wonderful uh, place for young musicians to get started performing. And he uh, invited me to, to play with him in China at the start of the pandemic. So obviously that didn't take place. And uh, the closest I ever got to my hometown was, was uh, Hong Kong. Thank you. And have you been to the places that your parents were in on their way to Shanghai? I've thought about that. I've thought about that. I mean, just to go back to, to see what Vladimir is, was or Pinsk of my mother's uh, beginnings. No, I have not retraced that. I've, I think an orchestra that over the years I played with more than any in the world though, and it's total coincidence because I was good friends with the music director, uh, is the Warsaw Philharmonic. And uh, I remember coming back from Moscow in 66, uh, after that sentimental journey of my parents joining me for the whole competition of three weeks, we stopped uh, in Warsaw and went to Danzig to visit, uh, I guess, his old haunting grounds of 26 years prior. So that much I had seen, but uh, certainly Warsaw and Danzig, but not, not their actual birthplaces, no. Thank you. Do you have um, anything of your parents, like their papers or visas or passports? I contacted many years ago the Holocaust Museum in DC, and uh, I got a very lovely letter back saying, we here are aware of your, your parents' plight. And they sent me the, the ship's manifest uh, that included my parents' names. And uh, my father, who, who was known in this country as Leon, it's Leib, L-I-E-B, life. And my mother was Chaya. So uh, why she changed her name to Lucy, my only guess is the popularity of Lucille Ball when she got here, because I can't think of any other possible reason. Thank you very much. And as a matter of fact, I actually pulled this document up as well and was going to share it. Um, so this is, as you said, the General Gordon um, sailing from Shanghai on November 28th, 1947. Oh. And you can see your parent, you and your parents here, Leib, Chaya, and Harry. Richard. There we are. They named me after Harry Truman because he saved their lives by uh, allowing them to enter the U.S. Wow. I've never seen that. And what's interesting here is that as of 1947, this document specifies that your parents were able to read and write in both English and German. Yeah, you see, I've learned something. I didn't know there was any English, except that he, he told stories of his engaging with US troops at the end of the war and starting a small business of charging a penny more here and there to make ends meet. So he must have learned English in their midst. Wow, this is amazing to see. Vladimiritz, there you go. And Pinsk, wow. So yes, this is where they were born. I will email this to you. My goodness. Well, now uh, you have me just awestruck. Thank you. Well, we're so happy that you're sharing your family's story today. Um, and especially, since this is a lesser known part of Holocaust history, um, we're so happy to bring attention to this part of our history and to teach our community about it. 
Um, and of course, we're so grateful that you have your um, that testimony of your parents sharing the story. Um, we have a couple other questions here. Did you feel different from other children growing up um, with having your um, come from being born in another country and having your parents um, with these traumatic experiences? Well, as I said earlier, not being aware of the experiences and only being aware that my parents spoke differently from the parents of my friends, I was one of those horrible kids who actually suggested to my parents that at PTA meetings, maybe they could kind of conceal their ac accents because uh, they seemed strange. How's that for being a horrible son? And uh, I was uh, uncomfortable growing up with the name Misha in Los Angeles. You can imagine uh, wanting to be one of the guys. It was not easy, but uh, I got wiser as I got older. Thank you for sharing. And um, we these stories about second generation children of survivors and survivors, it, I, we, I mean, these stories are certainly not uncommon. Um, and I'm sure that anybody listening to your story can understand and relate um, to the way that you felt when you were growing up. Is there anything else you would like to share about your parents or your story with our audience today? Well, in retrospect, putting it all together, uh, I think it's given a perspective of what really is horrible, what's really wonderful, what is a blessing, what is not to be taken too seriously. Uh, as my father said often in that video that began this, uh, so I decided to do this. It was dangerous, but we had nothing to lose. And if you come from a family that had, as it's beginning, nothing to lose, I think it puts a lot of things in perspective and I think it builds uh, a lot of strength and character. Thank you. And would you like to add anything else about the Jewish story in Shanghai? Um, anything for people who might be listening today who are not familiar with this chapter of Holocaust history? Well, in a nutshell, they were uh, expelled from uh, Kobe, Japan. They were thrust on the Chinese. Stories have it that uh, the Chinese were very welcoming as a people to them. Uh, it seems that the, the Japanese military thought differently and gave them a very, very hard time. Uh, my father was regularly rounded up simply for being himself and being a Jew and uh, thrown in jail. He tells a story in that video of uh, his being sentenced simply for not uh, showing up at a given moment that he was summoned uh, and it was in a cell some uh, sentenced for 12 days and some people were sentenced for six and he found out afterwards that those who had been sentenced to six uh, had all been poisoned and had all died and uh, th these are the sorts of things that he faced uh, every single day. There's a story that may be apocryph apocryphal but I love to think that it's true that that as the Japanese uh, were tightening their grip on Shanghai. They they summoned anybody who could be a representative of the Jewish of the Jewish community, and uh, a rabbi was sent to speak to the Japanese commander. And the Japanese asked the rabbi, "What is the problem that the Germans have with you people?" And the story goes that he said, uh, "The problem that they have is our Oriental roots." And from that moment on, the Japanese treated the, uh, the Jews a bit better. Uh, I don't know if that's true, either the story or that they were treated better after, but it's a story I like to think was true. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us this afternoon. We're so happy to have you as a part of our community to be sharing this story 
and of course, thanks to technology, you're able to share from the East Coast. So thank you very much um, again for sharing and we're, we're so glad to be able to highlight your family's story right now um, to be able to teach our community and of course in conjunction with our exhibit. So we invite everybody um, who is listening to come to the museum and visit the exhibit and learn more about uh, Jews of Shanghai. And uh, Misha, thank you again so much for sharing with us. We do have public survivor talks every Thursday at 11 o'clock Pacific time. So uh, we invite everyone to continue to tune in and we will have some more survivors um, from Shanghai sharing their stories as well throughout um, the next few months. So thank you so much everybody for listening and thank you for sharing. And uh, we hope to welcome everyone at the museum in person soon. Wishing thank everyone you. a happy, healthy, safe weekend. And thank you. Thank you. Be well. It's been an honor. Thank you so much. It's an honor to have you with us. Thank you.